this entrepreneur is one of the ones I've enjoyed speaking to most over the past dozen years. Um, you know, she's been local to Boston and has been a real success story. And Nicole Dawes has deeper roots than just about anyone in the business today because her roots are generational. She went to Expo West as a kid with her father, odd potato chips. And yet, after growing up in the business, she still wanted to be part of it. <laughs> Some people never get enough Soros. So she had the idea about going into business herself in her way with the goal of showing that organics could succeed as a brand principle. And this is something that, uh, you know, 15 years ago was very radical, um, that organics could succeed as a brand principle. That great taste wasn't exclusive to bioengineering, and that with her family, she could build another great brand. Late July was the result. And in so many ways, she's succeeded and it succeeded, but the story isn't always what you imagine it's going to be. And the space between results and expectations is often where the lessons lie in the entrepreneurial lifestyle. So we're going to hear some of these lessons and talk about some of them with Nicole Dawes. Please welcome her. I got a hug. No one hugged me. Okay, thank you. <laughs> well, I am very excited to be here because as Jeff mentioned, um, he actually interviewed me, I don't know how, how long, 10 years ago, for a Boston Magazine article. And it was one of our first real big articles at Late July. So uh, I mean, it always has a special place in my heart. What I wanted to do today was to just, for the first part of this, tell you a little bit about who I am and then my story so that when Jeff comes up and we do our Q&A, you know, I can place some context on um, the questions as he's asking. And then also, if something I've said resonates with you or is something that you're going through or you want to know more about, so that you have an opportunity to come up and talk to me personally, you know, afterwards, and then um, I'll be around for questions for a little bit, and then I'll also be at the lunch, so if you want to ask more questions. So obviously, there I am. Um, my... I'm, not, I'm gonna go a little bit out of order here, but when I first started in this industry, as Jeff mentioned, my dad had Cape Cod potato chips, but my mom also had a natural food store. So I think I'm what happens when you have a mom that's macrobiotic with a natural food store who has a dad started a potato chip company. I was literally only qualified for this one very specific job of running a natural uh, snack business. But after college, I actually went into management consulting first, and then my dad bought Cape Cod Potato Chips back, so I had the opportunity to go back and work with him as the director of marketing and run R&D. And I, there I was able to launch, um, I tried to launch organic, but I was way too far ahead of my time. And I managed to make a reduced fat chip, which was still one of their best sellers. It was a great experience. It also gave me, I think, what I needed to, the confidence and the skills I needed to launch late July, which I did uh, 15 years ago. Um, we sold it this past summer to the Campbell Soup Company and then I've decided to dive headlong into a brand new business, which you guys are going to be some of the first to, to hear about because we're, we're just launching. It'll be my last slide. So I'm founding Nixie Sparkling Water, launching next year. So that's who I am. OK, so here is my timeline. And when you look at it here, it looks so easy and uh, makes me feel really good about it. <laughs> but I'm going to go through some of these, and you're going to see that it, it definitely wasn't a straight line like it is in this timeline. We started in 2003. Um, my father had sold uh, Cape Cod potato chips the second time he'd retired. And you know, I had this idea that you know, I really wanted to launch an organic snack brand. It's something that had been plaguing me since I was a kid. I knew it was what I wanted to do. He, you know, he, he 
he wasn't as um, sure about the idea of it being organic as I was, but he believed in what I was trying to do enough that he decided to come out of retirement and join me. So we launched late July in 2003 as a cracker company. There's our first office um, holding my son who was, I was pregnant when I started and he's one in that picture. Um, he's 16 now. And, you know, it, we actually, you know, we had a great first couple years. We grew about 30% a year. We went, you know, 2 million, 4 million, 5 million, 6 million, 7 million. <laughs> and then we kind of hit 8 million. And, you know, it, it, it's, everything was still going very, very well. Um, but I, I wasn't feeling like crackers was our category. You know, I, I loved it. It was a great reason to launch. And part of the reason I launched in it was because at the time I was pregnant and I wanted an organic cracker. It didn't exist. I saw an opening and I thought, here's, you know, we're, let's dive in. Let's make something great, make organic taste the way I wanted it to taste, not like the organic of my mom's 1970 natural food store. Um, and that's what got us the success that, to that point. But then when my father actually died suddenly in 2009, um, our, we had flat growth that year. Our bank used his death as a technical default on our loan, which was a pretty significant one because it was for uh, about $4 million in equipment on a company with $8 million in sales. And, I mean, it just took the wind out of our sales. I mean, we really... I mean, on top of one hand, I'm dealing with the tragic and somewhat sudden death of my 60-year-old father, but to get that call from our bank just, I mean, three weeks after he died. Um, and my favorite part, and I, you know, I didn't keep the letter, and I regret that to this day, but I was just so mad at the time that I like threw it away immediately. But it said in the letter that they were gonna offer me time to cure it. And I'm thinking, like, this is my father's death. Like, why, I mean, obviously I can't cure that. Um, so, you know, my husband and I, who, who worked together, we sat down and we thought, okay, you know, we have, we don't have a lot of options here, but we believe in this company, you know, we're going to figure out a way to get past this. And it was a struggle. I mean, that year for about, I mean, as I, at the time when I was in it, I thought, we're going to get out of this, everything's going to be fine. But as I look back now, I realize that the odds on us getting out of that were incredibly slim. I mean, it was like... You know, there's this famous, in, in, you know, in the um, Apollo movie where they said 7,000 things need to happen in order for us to make out of this alive, and they all need to happen literally in order. And that was exactly where we were at that point. And what, what got us out of that was, I think, a combination of things. And this is one of the things that I think Jeff and I are going to talk about later, I hope, is entrepreneurial independence. I was so fortunate the way that I had financed the company up until that point, that I did have the entrepreneurial independence that I needed at that moment, because it was not going to be easy. And there were a lot of ways that that could have gone wrong. And I think if I didn't have control of the business, I can guarantee you I would not be standing here today talking to you, because I'm sure I would have been replaced. In fact, at my father's wake, one of our investors wanted to have a shareholders meeting. <laughs> um, so, you know, is I, like one of the things I think that was the most important reason that we made it through that year is that I didn't have, you know, I could do exactly what I thought was right. And I had the passion and the drive and the desire, frankly, and, and, and the need to make this succeed. I mean, failure just frankly wasn't an option for me. I had no safety net. I had nothing else to, to, to turn to. I needed to make this work. So luckily, we actually found a great bank called RSF Social Finance, which... If you don't know about them, um, please write that down if you are ever looking for financing. They finance um, socially responsible businesses and nonprofits. And they did a more thorough um, review of our company than any bank I've ever worked with, frankly. They came and spent time at our office. They got to know us. They sent one of their board members to meet with us. I mean, it was, um, it was a real partnership. And it was down to the wire. I mean, I think it might have been you know, the 59th minute of the 11th hour when I finally closed that. But we luckily made it out of that year. And something else happened that year, which was for years I'd wanted to launch a tortilla chip. I tried to get my dad to do it at Cape Cod Chips, but he wouldn't because he, you know, he, he really felt they were a potato chip company. 
and also at, at late July, I'd been trying to kind of push that and you know, the whole time he said, you know, we, don't, we just don't want to be in the salty snack aisle. I mean, I, DSD, it was, I, I don't think we should do that. It's too hard. We'll never succeed as organic. And that voice of reason was gone. <laughs> so, hey, um, you know, I feel like that's who we are. I, I struggled. We launched cookies. I didn't feel connected to that line, even though they were $2 million in revenue out of eight. I felt like they weren't who we should be. They weren't healthy enough. I didn't feel they represented like the future of who our brand should be. So um, my husband and I made the really difficult decision to discontinue our cookies and to launch tortilla chips, which, you know, I, I think um, it was hard too because one of the cookies we were discontinuing had a, a, the cover of the box had a picture of my father and my kids, and um, you know, here he had just passed away, and I'm discontinuing it. Uh, but it, it turned out to be the best decision we ever made as a company because focusing who we were and honing in on our brand messaging and making our story that much stronger by um, launching the tortilla chips and discontinuing the things that just didn't represent who I thought our brand should stand for um, was the real turning point in, I mean, honestly, you know, the overnight success story is seven years in the making if you just ignore those first seven years, because from 2010 to 2018, I mean, we went from eight million to you know 130 million dollars in sales, and it was um, you know we we moved our office, this beautiful headquarters in Boston, as opposed to you know the the picture you see there with the with my baby. We became the number one um, tortilla chip natural tortilla chip in the country. I mean, we were number one in virtually every store that we sold in. We developed a team of people that is, in my opinion, the best in the business, which is something that we worked really hard for over those years. And one of the things that we also did, which was something that I am probably one of my proudest accomplishments of everything on this slide, is building a company culture that took us a long time to get to. Because, you know, I think that so much of what we were trying to do was to you know, break away from kind of the old way that, that you, you are a CEO or how you run things and, and the new way of how I wanted my company to be. You know, allowing kids in the office and dogs and giving people results-oriented workplace and, um, you know, a lot of that stuff is kind of scary because you're the first people doing it or, you know, some of your investors or, or the people that you work with might not feel it's a good idea. Uh, but we, you know, over the next 10 years, we completely changed our company culture to make sure that it was that kind of a workplace and that, um, you know, every day people came into work and, you know, they worked hard and they worked all the time, but that they felt good about it and they felt that they were in a supportive environment that, you know, allowed them to also kind of live their life. So that is, that's my story. And the last part of this story, <laughs> which is the part where I can't decide, um, is the proof that I've lost my mind or um, the evidence I haven't at all is that we, so after we sold late July this summer, we decided to, you know, I, I thought to myself, my diet consists almost exclusively of three things, tortilla chips, salsa, and sparkling water. And I've already made tortilla chips and salsa, so that only leaves one potential new product for me, and that's sparkling water. So in 2019, we're launching our new brand, which is Nixie Sparkling Water, and um, I'll get the chance to tell you a little bit more about it uh, when I talk with Jeff. But, um, you know, it's, it's the product I'm most excited about that I've ever launched, and I never thought I'd be able to make that statement again after our jalapeno lime tortilla chips, which previously was the product I was most excited about. But um, I really feel like this is the thing I've been working for my entire life. It combines all of the components of um, what I want a brand to be in, into one. And I, you know, part of with Late July, what I think made us successful was that you know, we were a trustworthy brand, with delicious taste, fun, and at a great price. And I think a lot of brands out there are one or two of those things, but it's very, very difficult to be all four of them. And that's what we did at late July, and that's what we are doing with Nixie as well. So, Jeff? <laughs> That was terrific. I, I, let's do those four points one more time. Sure. Trustworthy brand. Yeah. Great price. What yep. else? 
taste. Mm -hmm. I mean, the taste is, I mean, I think the minute you lose sight of the fact that we're in the food and beverage business, I mean, taste is the number one reason why people make a second purchase. Yeah. I mean, the attributes will only get you so far. Yeah. They might get you the first purchase, but they'll almost never get you the second purchase. Um, so taste, very and, important. And, and number four? Well, it, so the trustworthiness, fun. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because I, I, I feel like sometimes we take ourselves too seriously as natural product brands. I mean, because like, we, all, we all have very strong values and we care about you know, what we're doing. But uh, food and beverage should be fun. It shouldn't be, you know, it, it sh you know you're, I'm not looking for my, my food to, um, you know, lecture at me or, or, you know, I'm looking at to enhance the good parts of my life. Do you feel like there are a lot of really serious brands out there right now, though? Well, I feel like there are brands that aren't fun. Okay. I feel like there are brands who are serious, and I feel like there's a lot of brands who are just not fun. Okay. You know, like you look at it and it just could be private label or it could be, you know, it's just not, there's not, there's no compelling brand to connect with. So I do feel like there's that. So great taste is fun. And that's always, you know, that's always going to push a brand forward. But how do you make a brand more fun? I guess would be the first question I want to ask you. Well, I think it starts with packaging. I mean, that was one of the things that I found so fascinating with late July is, you know, as I, wa I would walk the aisles, and a lot of times people had the misconception that natural products needed to be in products that made them look natural. And, you know, that was such a, fr a point of frustration for me after spending all of my childhood in a 1970s natural food store. You know, I didn't want my products to look like the products that were on her shelf then. Yeah. I it wanted them to have bright colors and feel happy and, you know, have pictures of real food on them. And um, so I feel like the packaging does is, is a a key component to, to that. Do you feel that people should be hiring designers then? I, I mean, it's, it's, it's funny because I see so many free from type products or wear not this type products that really use big block letters and, you know, sort of like ominous shades. Um, is that something that a, a brand can reverse on their own or...? Well, so, like, we went through cycles with that at late July. So, like, you know, when we first launched our tortilla chips, I mean, we whispered it on the front that they're organic and they have all these great... I mean, our nutritional profile on our multigrain chips was probably better than 99% of the breakfast cereals in the aisle. I mean, it was really a, one of the... Probably one of the healthier products in the entire center part of the grocery which, store. Which was good because you basically ate it. I did. I, I think Breakfast, lunch, I did. dinner. It's true. <laughs> she, would, she would scarf two I, bags I mean, I'm day. not kidding when I say it's... Almost my entire diet yeah. consists of that, um, which is probably also why I had to discontinue the cookies. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I, 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 so, you know, we whispered it on the packaging. We knew it was great. It was on our nutrition facts, but we didn't scream it on the front. Um, and then, you know, as we, you know, as we, as people got more comfortable with our brand and knew how it tasted so they wouldn't be turned off by it, then we started dialing it up a little bit so you could see it more clearly. Now... When I interviewed you 10 years ago, and it's amazing that we're 10 it's years old. It's been amazing older, 10 years. Yeah. <laughs> um, you said that the, one of the things that I kept hammering at you about was that there was so much money coming into the sector. And you were, as we've discussed, so intent on maintaining entrepreneurial independence, you weren't going to touch it. Now... That was also a time that cause was much smaller as part of the sector. Uh, or or that, that financial institutions weren't as aware of the power of cause as part of the sector. So I got to ask you the same question that I've been asking you for 10 years. Would you work with an institutional investor now? You know, I, that's one of the areas where I've definitely evolved over the years. And I think because I think they have. Okay. You know, I think that what I've seen in that, um, sector is companies that have done a great job, um, you know, trying to understand how to work with entrepreneurs. I think, you know, when I was first looking at funding, it wasn't that way. I mean, it was much more old school, much more, you know, a little bit more old fashioned. Whereas today, I feel like people are better at working with entrepreneurs and understanding the value of an entrepreneur. But I also think as an entrepreneur, you have to be extremely careful about when and who you choose to work with. Because if your company isn't at the right point, 
you know, you, you, can't, you can't put g gas on a fire that doesn't exist. Yeah. And I feel like, you know, that's the problem sometimes if you partner too soon or you partner with the wrong people. I mean, you, you know, entrepreneurs are the best people to work out the problems for their company. And only once they've worked out at least, you know, a good majority of them should they have any kind of institutional money at all. Prior to that, it should be exclusively angels, friends and family, that kind of stuff. Now, one of the things that enables you to do that is you've always run a ridiculously lean <laughs> organization. That is true. Um, <laughs> you know, so uh, this, this is a, how many how many people did you have at late July at the end? We were doing you know over 130 million dollars in sales with 24 people. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that, that represents like a, a staff increase of about 400% from yes, the yeah. initial team. Well, so uh, why do you stay so lean aside from payroll? There's a couple of reasons. Um, one of the reasons is that I really believe that fast growth and cross-functionality are incredibly intertwined. I don't think that you can grow a fast, nimble company where you have any kind of siloed situation going on. And the more employees you get, you know, the easier it is for people to become siloed. And I also think that the absolute worst thing you can do is to bring in the wrong person. Um, because you know the wrong person, if they're toxic or they don't fit with your team, you know can really screech the whole thing to a halt. Um, and that was something that we took incredibly seriously. We also didn't have an HR department, <laughs> so that could have something to do with it. I made everyone hire their own people. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess the question there is, when you have that sort of cross functionality, um, you know everyone knows how to do everything. It, it's got to be hard to then transfer new, transfer those responsibilities to someone new. Well, actually, I think it's the opposite because you know the, the way that we, I mean, the way that we kind of grew our teams was if you, you know, you're so cross-functional that um, you know you almost never. You, 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 almost, you wouldn't train somebody to come in at like a high level, almost never, because, it, you know, right away. Yep. Um, usually what we would do is we would have people hire people under them. Then they'd get the exposure to the cross-functionality, and then that person would move up. Um, you know, I think a good example of when we did bring someone in was a, um, a director of finance. And I looked for him for almost two years. So that goes to show, because I feel like that's a position where you can very easily get someone who brings the wrong energy to the company. Yeah, yeah. And he just happened to come from a very similar situation where, um, you know, he dealt with a lot of things within a unit of a bigger organization. And so he kind of hit the ground running. Um, he had the right attitude. But what we do is we do like an immersion protocol, basically, where you have to sit in on every meeting and, and just you know, ask millions of questions and, you know, kind of get to know the other parts that you don't know. And we push people into areas they're uncomfortable with. I mean, Kaylin, who does marketing for me, is here today. And, I mean, she's an operations expert, too, uh, because <laughs> of that, whether she liked it or not. <laughs> so let, let's talk about product strategy yes. for a second. Um, Very important. You pivoted so heavily uh, away from cookies. Um, oh, yes, so we did. You know, I, I imagine having a nimble organization helped you do that. But again, like, can you explain to the uh, entrepreneurs here the sort of process that you go through when thinking, I'm going to cut off a quarter of my revenue? Yes. Okay, so I think what's important, and I've discovered that you should give a product like a two-year window. That's like, that's the appropriate amount of time. Still? Well, I think so, because you really have to give it a year to get in. Yeah. Because you just don't know before that. And then a year to assess. I mean, if it's horrible, I mean, maybe. Yeah. But if it's, and what you're looking for in that time period is velocity. Okay. And you have to create, like, targets. Like, okay, um, this is the fourth best seller in the category. You know, I should be able to beat that product. If I don't beat that product, then you know we need to take a look at is is our retail strategy wrong? Is our price wrong? You know, look at some of these other factors. And if retail strategy is right, your price is right, 
then, then it's you're a product. Yeah, then it's on the right track. <laughs> and and I think that you know you if you but if the velocity is there, even at a small scale, you well, know, with with some promo pricing, whatever, then you can figure. Okay, it's not the product; it's something else. But wasn't it there for the cookies? You know, well, the cookies was a the cookies was a complicated problem because part of the issue with the cookies was they were really connected to our whole brand strategy. Yep. And, you know, what we wanted was like a breakout hit. Okay. You know, I mean, on deal or, you know, in a display, I mean, our chips could sell, you know, several hundred units. You know, our cookies and crackers would sell 12. I mean, that just wasn't going to be the product that got us to the, you know, where we needed to be. And the problem with the cookies was twofold. And the reason we just didn't discontinue the crackers, we picked the cookies, was because we made the most amazing cookies ever in the history of organic food. <laughs> I mean, we took real Madagascar vanilla and real dark chocolate, and we created these amazing things that we probably should have been selling for like twenty-five dollars. Yeah, a box. but so for you the priority was developing turns, developing speed, and you we, just can't do we it. We couldn't do it in that okay. product. And we couldn't, we couldn't get the price we needed. We couldn't, for, that, for that product, it was really a price issue. Yeah. We could never be the price we needed to be, and we didn't want to sacrifice the ingredients. So, um, and you know, when you, when you lose money, you don't make it up in volume, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> well, unless you're getting, you know, investment, right? <laughs> right, well, that, yeah, I think that's a pyramid scheme. Yeah, um, so I want to ask, <laughs> I want to ask, you know, your read on where the industry is now. Um, is it healthier? Are the entrepreneurs better prepared? I know you, you mentor them, a lot of them. Um, and what's the mistake that they keep making all the time? Um, I mean, I, I'm so excited about where this industry is. I mean, I, like when I look back over like my career and just starting again in the 70s and that, I mean, it was very cool. Natural foods are very 70s, but nothing in it tasted that great. And, you know, versus where we are today, where you have so many committed, passionate entrepreneurs creating products that are awesome. Um, you know, in living a life that they can be proud of, too. You know, yeah. I feel like that's, I'm just, I love, I mean, I love everything about where we ended up with Late July. It's, it just makes me so incredibly proud, and I see so many other companies on that trajectory, and that's awesome. I mean, I think the single biggest problem that I hear still is, is recognizing products with your, problems with your products. It's very hard for entrepreneurs to, to admit that and to come to terms with that, that, you know, maybe how they started really isn't where they're going to go. And, you know, separating from something that is preventing them from really having their success. You know, a product that they love maybe, but just, you know, if the velocity is not there, you know, unfortunately, that the products, it's, it's, not, it's not for you. <laughs> like, you need to cut it loose. Yeah. Um, so products are definitely, I mean, I think funding decisions will forever be, you know, that is the perennial problem. You know, who do you pick? Who do you work with? How do you find the right funding? And how do you find partners that are going to support you while you figure it out? Because, I mean, every good entrepreneur is going to need a chance to figure it out. How do you find them? Well, I think that, I mean, for us, it was going with friends and family first. You know, okay. um, we, and then, you know, the, and also structuring your deal so that when you do have problems, you know, you're going to have the opportunity to fix them. That's also incredibly important no matter who you work with, you know, so that you can't get replaced at the first sign of trouble. Um, and then, you know, we had made a deal with Strategic early on, and, you know, that um, was a lot of lessons there, which I know a lot of people are, are doing now. That's a very popular thing. It was, I don't think a lot of people did it when we did it. It was a little bit more yeah. unusual. Yeah. Um, and then I think finally, you know, nowadays there are better institutional partners out there that I don't think really were available back when I was doing it. Certainly. So we need to wrap up. I know you're going to be here for questions throughout lunch, and I'm just delighted to finally have you here. Yeah, so. no, I'm so, I, and I really want to extend that. To, you know, I, I feel like I made so many mistakes over the past 15 years, and then I fixed a lot of them. Um, 
so I want to, you know, if, if people do have questions or they want to know more, I'm going to be around here for the next 15 minutes, and then I've got to go do something <laughs> else. <laughs> and then I'm coming back for the lunch, so I'll be around to answer more questions. Well, thanks for answering ours. Oh, it's, it's so good to be here. Thank you. Thank you.